Well, I feel like I'm a, I'm a week off. Uh, <laughs> last week we talked about Eden, and it should have been today, shouldn't it? Uh, today we're going to talk about Adam. Uh, and we're in Genesis uh, 3, and today will probably be the last lesson we have in Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to uh, go on before next week. I'm at verse 17. If you want to turn there in your Bible or look at your handout when it comes around. Chapter 3 is why things are the way they are. Why is there sin? Why is there death? What happened? It was so nice in Genesis 1 and 2. And everything was very good. And then what happened? Well, what happened was Genesis chapter 3, the temptation of Eve and her seduction, and then the uh, rebellion uh, of Adam following her. And sin came into the world. Well, part of chapter 3, what it's about, is what's called the curse, theologically. Some things happened. Uh, when they partook of the fruit and they uh, disobeyed God, the curse is the result of what happened. God came to them, called them out on it, <clears throat> held them accountable, and he gave each one of them. He started with Satan. He cursed him. He started uh, after that with Eve, uh, which we looked at that last week. Today, he's going to be talking directly to Adam. Uh, to man and mankind uh, inclusively. Let me read it for you. It says, God to Adam said, Because you've heeded the voice of your wife, and you've eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of that. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil, toil shall you eat of it all the days of your life. In both thorns and thistles it will bring forth for you. You shall eat the herb of the field, and in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Notice he says, it's because you heeded the voice of your wife. Amen. Did you notice that? Now this is the only time that I can find in scripture that that's a bad thing. So I'm, I'm going to just... Point that out. Don't use this as a general formula for married life. But, uh, this is a principle because what happened in the garden was Eve had a conversation with the serpent, was deceived by him, and plucked the fruit, and Adam was there with her, saying nothing, and she turned to him and offered him the fruit and he took it. Yes. So, in this instance, <laughs> trouble came because he heeded the voice of his wife because he knew that that was a sin. It was rebellion against God. The rest of the time, listen to the voice of your wife. <laughs> okay, now, the curse begins when he says to Adam, he says, cursed is the ground for your sake. Now, what's pertinent about that is because Adam had already been appointed as the keeper of the Garden of, the garden of Eden. The uh, culture sometimes talk about the, the oldest uh, profession in the world. You know what I'm talking about? I see some blank words. It's farmers. It's not what the culture says. I'm not even going to go into that. Uh, Father, Father God spoke to Adam and he immediately cursed his livelihood. As gardener and keeper of the Garden of Eden, he says, from now on, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be cursed for your sake. It's going to be toil. Now, toil is a good word. Uh, some people loosely translate it work, but it's more than that. It's gruesome work. It's, it's unfulfilling work. It's toilsome to have to go out there day after day and, and do that. Mother Nature was changed at this moment because he said from now on it will bring forth to you thorns and thistles Amen. they weren't there before the roses evidently had no thorns he says in the sweat of your face you're going to eat bread till you return to the ground and this must have been so disheartening <clears throat> to adam because you remember adam was created out of the dust of the earth god took the dirt formed man breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Uh, Eve was not made that way. Eve was taken out of Adam. 
Uh, he says this to Adam because he was made out of dirt, mm. made out of dust, and to dust you will return. Now, many people don't realize this matter of the curse, how wide-ranging it was. Uh, we can read through these couple of verses here in Genesis 3, and we might get the impression that uh, the curse happened to the Garden of Eden. Or if you want to be a little broader, you might say, well, the curse happened to all of planet Earth. Uh, I want to suggest to you that the curse at this very moment when they partook of the fruit, extended to the entire created universe. Yes. All space, all time, all matter, everything was immediately changed. I'd like to read for you. Romans 8, 18 following. Paul says, I consider that all of the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which will be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits the revealing of the sons of God. For all of the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now here. For we know that the entire creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. Yeah. I don't have to go into a lot of commentary on that. It's pretty plain that when Adam and Eve fell and, and, pre and uh, introduced sin into the Garden of Eden, it in a moment of time spread to the entire created universe. It's all fallen. It's all, it's all cursed. Uh, Things changed. Nature changed. Animals changed. Men and men and women changed. It reaches through the whole creation. Now, <coughs> toil, toil. That part of work that had suddenly been, hmm, I think it had been joyful for Adam in the Garden of Eden. I think as gardener and caretaker of that beautiful place, he must have had a lot of satisfaction. Must have enjoyed the beauty. Uh, but now suddenly God's changed it to toil. But Job, Job says this, Is there not a time of hard service for man on the earth? Are not his days also like the days of a hired man? Yeah. Like a servant who earnestly desires to sit in the shade, and like a hired man who eagerly looks for his wages. Job knew toil. Job knew that the, the, the work that we do had been changed. And when God told him, you're dust, you were made from dust, and the dust you return, that must have been a heady confrontation to Adam. Uh, Adam would have been one who could have talked to you and explained to you that God Almighty leaned over him one day as he lay on the ground and looked and he just breathed into his nostrils the breath of God, yeah. the Holy Spirit. Now, Mike did such a good job this morning talking about the image of God and people. Uh, I believe that's when it was imparted, when God breathed into him through the Spirit, and he became a living soul, the Scripture says. But here, here, he's less than that. Here, because of the sin, because of the fruit, because if something doesn't happen, he's lost forever. He's, he's, he's doomed. Uh, dust you are, and dust to dust you will return. So it's it's a bad situation right here. Adam has just been told by God that you're a mortal being. Uh, you're not going to have the tree of life where you live. You're not, I'm going to borrow it from you. I'm going to take it from you. This is a curse. Mortality. And the day that you take from it, you will die. That's what God said, right? But, well, excuse me and correct me if I'm wrong, but that happened apparently several days before this text. And is he not still standing there? Is he not conversing with God? Well, the answer is yes. So what does that verse mean? Is it wrong? In the day that you eat of it, you will die? No, it's not wrong. It's not wrong because there's several types of death in the Bible. 
there is physical death. But that's not what eating the fruit meant. The moment that Adam and Eve took that fruit, that they didn't drop down dead. It was not physical death. But what did happen that was not apparent to the eyes was their spirits died. They fell in sin and they no longer had intimate communion with God anymore. They died, spiritually speaking. This thing about death and the curse, it started right here. Uh, I want to share with you Romans 5.12 uh, because this applies to us. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all of sin. Uh, did you get that? Did you hear yourself in there? Uh, a lot of people don't realize this and don't understand this, but sin, it says, came into the world through one man. One. One solitary man, Adam. Because of what he did in the garden, his sin came into the world through him. But it gets worse. Because he allowed sin into the world, death came with it. Adam died spiritually. Eve yeah. died spiritually. There their need to be saved uh, began at that moment because they're going to physically die and they'll be lost. And then Romans 5.12 goes on, and this is what is astounding. It says, and thus that death that came through Adam, that one man, it spread to all men and women. Everyone that comes into this world receives it. It's communicated. Because death is spread to all men, because of all sin. So death has come. That was Paul in Romans 5.12. Let me, let me share with you 1 Corinthians 15.22. It says, For as in Adam all die, in Christ all will be made alive. To each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards those that who are Christ that is coming. Now, that's a reversal. I, I don't know if you caught that. You know, Romans 5, 12 basically says that we've all sinned and we all fall short of the glory of God. We've all died. If something doesn't happen, if something does not intervene, and then 1 Corinthians 15, 22 comes in and it tells us, well, that's true, in Adam you died, but in Christ you can be made alive. Thank you. And you accept him as your Savior. This thing about the curse, uh, you know, we've been like three weeks on this, right? We, we talked about the serpent, and we talked about Eve, and we talked about Adam now. Uh, the curse, They're right there in Genesis chapter 3, the very front of your Bible. And if, uh, truth be told, the rest of your Bible is the story of what God did to reverse that curse. Right? Right. It, sin and death came very early in the story. But the rest of the Bible, all the Old Testament, the sending of the prophets, the offering up of sacrifices, teaching people about uh, the way to God, the birth of Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension into heaven, all of that was because of this. All of that took place because God had to reverse the mess that Adam and Eve created when they allowed sin and death to come into the world. So, let me back that up for you. Galatians 3.13. It says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it's written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. You can go back to Genesis 3, verses 17 and following, and make you a list of everything that happened with the curse. And if you're a diligent student of the Word of God, you can go to the New Testament and you can find examples where Christ reversed every single one of them. Yes. Including access to the tree of life. It's an amazing accomplishment that took over 4,000 years of God's working to bring Christ into the world at the fullest of time. Jesus bore the curse. Um, We've got an amazing story in the gospel. You know this thing about uh, 
Um, Adam, it, it, it's, it's tragic, you know, and I'm saying Adam a lot today. He, you're right there with him. Uh, it's man and woman, humankind, people. They all were subjected to this curse when sin came into the world. And then all of their uh, descendants, their children, they all were born with sin in their world and in their lives, uh, all the way down to us. Uh, it's sort of a, a disease that uh, only Jesus Christ was able to come. But let's go on. Uh, verse 20. Uh, I like this verse. Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Well, that's appropriate for Mother's Day, is it not? Amen. Uh, she was the mother of all living. Right? I've got a mother. But she's gone. Uh, got a grandmother. Got a great grandmother. Got another great great grandmother. Goes a long way back. But we get way back there. Eve was the mother of, of my family. Isn't that something? I mean, you're still all of you. She's the mother of all living. Uh, and we spent a lot of time in Genesis 1 arguing and, and proving that evolution is a lie. That we did not have multiple ancestors and they were not <laughs> apes. Uh, we're, we're, I, think, I hope we're done with that. The point of Scripture is there was one couple at the beginning of time. Amen. Adam and Eve. They, they all of this that we see and all these people we look at, they all descended from one couple. And he called her Eve. Now you might say, what? Well, you know, we already knew that. Well, you didn't know that, not from the scripture, because before Genesis 3.20, she was called everything in the world but Eve. I, I learned something in this. For instance, uh, she was called in Genesis 1.27 when she was first made, she was called a female. And then in Genesis 2.18, she was called a helper. And then in Genesis 2.22, she was called a woman. And then we get to Genesis 2.24 and 25, and she's called a wife. But she's never been called Eve yet until we get to verse 20. Now, I think it's interesting that Adam named her. I don't know what the significance of that is. Uh, you remember back in Genesis 1 and 2, he named all the animals, right? And then he got through naming all the animals, and Scripture tells us he looked around at all of them. They were all squared away, and he, and he looked at himself and said, I don't have anyone. I, I'm alone. I don't have anyone like me. And God created Eve. Well, this is when she finally gets her name. The mother of all living. Uh, what's interesting about this to me is that at this point she's not a mother. She's Adam's wife, but they don't have any children yet. She's she's a, a helper. She's a female, certainly, uh, and a wife, but she doesn't have any kids. And yet he calls her the mother of all living. It's prophetic in its implications for us. I wonder, and I might be going out on a limb here, but I wonder about this, why Adam called her the mother of all living. Uh, but if you'll remember last week when we talked about Genesis 3.15, the proto of Evangelium, in Espanol, si quiere. Si. Genesis 3.15 gives a prophecy where it says that God, uh, he's talking to, to the serpent, he says I, that, that uh, you will bruise his heel, but he will bruise your head. Remember that? Uh, and he said, but he said something interesting in the verse. He said to the serpent, this is all going to happen by the seed of the woman. And that's peculiar. You never find that anywhere else in Scripture. Seed is always from the man, not from the woman. And I believe it's an implication of the virgin birth that God is talking about in Genesis 3.15. Uh, the seed of the woman is, the, is going to crush the head of Satan. Well, clearly, Adam was standing there, taking all this in, and he's talking to Eve and the serpent about her being the mother 
having a seed who would crush Satan one day in Jesus Christ. I think that probably that, that got the wheel spinning for Adam, that she was going to be a mother. I don't know if he thought that before. Maybe he had, maybe he had. But I think when he calls her the mother of all living, that's where it came from. Uh, you know, we're going to be looking in a few weeks into the genealogies in Genesis about the, the, uh, the tribe of nations of the world, where they all come from. One of the interesting things about this with Eve, you know, like I've already said, we all came from her. Every one of you are a direct descendant from me. Uh, we, we had this bad thing happen back in Genesis 6. It was called Noah's Flood. It wiped out uh, Noah. Um, everybody, the world, <laughs> except for Noah and his family. Uh, so you could say when the waters went down and Noah's family walked outside, from that point on, everyone was a descendant of Noah's wife. Before it was Eve, then it was Noah. Uh, we're all children of the family of Noah. All humanity comes from that, uh, that post-flood generation. Eve is uh, an interesting person in the scripture because of the conversation with Satan, because of the fall, because of the curse, uh, but because of her, the rest of her life as well. She, it says in Genesis 5, 4, had many sons and daughters. Mm. We know about Cain and Abel and Seth, certainly, the first, but she went on to have many more children as people did back in that age when they lived hundreds of years. You know, I'm looking forward uh, to one day seeing my mother again. Mm -hmm. I know all of you are too that have lost your mothers. Uh, it's going to be something that I'm going to have on my mind immediately when I arrive on the premises. Uh, I'm going to ask if I can see her. Uh, that's going to be wonderful. and. Uh, all well and good, but have you ever thought about the implications of asking to see Eve and have a conversation with her? I don't know how many, but great, 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 greats uh, she holds over you as her, your grandmother, but won't it be interesting to discuss the fall, the curse, their subsequent salvation, their children, It's an amazing experience to be a Christian and to know that you can have eternal life, <clears throat> a life without end. Amen. Well, let's go on. Genesis 5:21. God clothes Adam and Eve. It says also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Why? Why this little detail? Well, it, very good reason why this is here. Uh, if you go back just a few verses. You find uh, Adam and Eve making uh, clothes out of fig leaves and sewing them together, it says. In order that they might cover themselves up, they discovered they were naked all of a sudden and they wanted to hide from the Lord God Almighty. Uh, none of that worked out. Uh, God removed their fig leaves and replaced them with skins of animals here. Now, this is the first death of animals in the world, in history, ever. There had been no death prior to this. No physical death. And uh, people often say, well, well uh, what about dinosaurs? And secular scientists might try to teach you, well, they were three and a half billion years before this. There were 600 billion years before this. And I say to them that's not correct because the scripture teaches that death came at the fall. Yes. Death came by the act of Adam and Eve. And if death came at the fall of Adam and Eve, then there is no death prior to them. Therefore, there are no fossils that predate Adam and Eve. They all had to have died after Adam and Eve. Well, what this is signifying here in Genesis 3.21 is that 
uh, Adam and Eve's uh, covering of themselves with fig leaves does work. Sin is not covered by leaves. Sin is covered by the shedding of blood. Amen. Now, it's some several thousand years from Genesis 3.21 to Matthew 1.1 1, 1, when Christ was born to die on the cross for our sins. It's, it's quite a passage of time. And during that entire time, if you read your Old Testament, you'll discover God is teaching through the death of animals that it's by the shedding of blood that there is remission of sin. Mm -hmm. Now one day, that would come to entail his only begotten son who died on a cross that, that we might be forgiven of our sins. What is the cost of sin? What's the price of sin? It took thousands of years for people to realize that killing a goat or an oxen or a pigeon does not pay for a sin, not one single solitary sin. It's not enough. There's only one thing. There's only one blood that can pay for sin. And it turned out to be the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. Sinless God and man shedding his blood. That's what it cost for. This 321 right here, you can highlight in your Bible because it's the very first time in the, in the Old Testament in the Bible where God indicates that someone has to die when sin is in the house. Amen. That's why it's there. An animal had to die there. The Lord had to kill an animal and skin it and sew these skins together to make clothing for Adam and Eve. You can, you can read that verse, you can meditate upon it, but it's very clear that it was God who killed, it was God who skinned, and it was God who clothed them. He dressed them there in the garden to show them that there was a covenant for their sin. Somebody said there's only two religions in the world. There's the religion of fig leaves, and there's the religion of animal skins. Fig leaves is what Adam and Eve tried to do to cover up their nakedness and their shame. Didn't work. Never works. Works. Human works, you know. I'll just get busy. I'll be a good girl. I'll be a good boy. And I'll, uh, I'll be better than that person next door. You know, good works is man's religion. It's fig leaves is what it is. And it doesn't ever work. It's only by the shed blood provided by God. Amen. Dressed by him with the Lord Jesus Christ. He clothed him. I think, you know, you could write beside this verse a little further. You could say, Jesus saves. Right here. I think Adam and Eve, they were lost. They've been found, and right here they're saved. And God clothes them with skins. You understand? You can write your name in there, too. It's the same thing. Amen. Genesis 3, 22. Uh, the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he puts out his hand and he takes also the tree of life and he eats and lives forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Whew, poignant. What a picture. From being placed in the Garden of Eden as caretakers and gardeners without any sin anywhere around, to being driven from it. Let it soak in, because it's your story, and it's mine. God said, looking at the situation with Adam and Eve, the serpent, he said, they've become like one of us, notice plural, us, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They've become like us. Well, how have they become like us? Are they omnipotent? Are they omnipresent? No, not at all. They're not. But what they have done in taking up the fruit is attempted in their sin to be like God in, or, in order to decide what is good and what's bad. Yeah. What's right and what's wrong. Uh, I don't need 
God to tell me what's right and wrong. I can figure that out for myself. I know God said don't eat this, but I'm going to eat from it, and I'll make a decision, I'll make a judgment, and I'll say this is good or this is bad or I don't care. And then from then on, I can just make all these little decisions every day as I go through my life the way I want to, using my reason, my mind, and I will, I will get through life, and I don't need God giving me direct revelation anymore. Mm. I don't need the Word of God. I can be like Him. And that's what the problem was for Adam and Eve and for us. So, today, and I, 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 I don't know how to express the frustration that I feel looking at our culture today. Mm -hmm. The dissolution of our culture. And I, I'm, I, I don't want to scream or, or be mean or hurt. It, it just it makes me sick yeah. Yeah. to see people who have lost any semblance of, of asking God what is his will for my life. Mm -hmm. Every man does what's right in his own eyes, as it says in Judges. We can't figure out what bathroom to go to, what sex we are. We, we have no guiding light anymore in our culture. We have no principles other than ego and personal attack and slander. It's as if, it's as if, you know, our culture just wants to shake its fist at God and say, just show me one of your commandments so I can break it. Yeah. That's the, that's the sense I'm getting these days. Uh, it's brazen and it's bold uh, and it's crass. Uh, we're doing it to our children. Our children are being exposed to things that uh, grown men would have shuddered at 30 years ago. Right. And, and we've got it available to our kids. And we're passing laws to make them obey it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's got to be close, Lord Jesus, Mary Martha, I don't know. Yeah. But we've got to stand up. Because what happened right here in Genesis 3 is going on today. In a grander scale. Yes. To know... Uh, to decide to take into my own hands the knowledge of good and evil and I don't need God is exactly what happened to Adam and Eve and caused their fall. And notice this is uh, this is before <coughs> Cain and Abel. It's before Seth. Uh, they've had a time of walking in the garden and seeing, I believe, with their eyes, the Lord Jesus Christ every afternoon when the sun would got cool, conversing with him, talking about things. They've gone from that to this, where God is literally driving them out of the Garden of Eden, outside this garden, you understand, and he's placing them out of Eden. That was probably still pretty nice. But they're driven out. It's a principle that God enforces consistently, and he still does today, that when we personally choose to sin and go our own way, the Bible uses the expression, God gave them up to their own devices. Mm. Read Romans 1 and 2. It's as if God is saying, oh, that's what you want? Well, here, let me give you a little taste of it, and then you come back and talk to me and see how that's working out. And that's what he's doing here with Adam and Eve. They're outside. And then, when he got them outside the garden, they're probably out in a very lush world, a very nice world, but still fallen. He puts them out there, and he brings one of the highest angels known in the scriptures, a cherubim, to guard the gate with a sword. Why? Well, it's so they can't come back in. What's in there? A couple of things. One of them is the tree of life. Yeah. You take of it, which it was freely offered to them before they sinned, you take of it, you, got, you live for eternity. No more. No more. It's taken away from them. Free access to that. From now on, they have to learn when they leave this garden that they have to come through the blood to be saved and to be obedient to God in order to, uh, to partake of the tree of life and live forever. That's the same for you too, by the way. Amen. Nothing's changed on that. We don't want them to take of the tree of life and eat it and live forever. 
unless unless God clothes them with skin remnants in their case and you with the shed blood of Jesus Christ that's how you, you uh, obtain the tree of life he sent them out of the garden you know I don't I wonder I, <clears throat> I wonder if Adam and Eve minded did they want to stay in the garden it had some bad memories didn't it the, the evil serpent had really messed things up for them there. Uh, God had probably, it was, was embarrassing when God had to say to Adam, where are you? They were hiding under some bushes. Uh, maybe they wanted to go, maybe they didn't. It's not important. But both of them, Adam and Eve, I'm quite certain, were ruining the day that they were barred from meeting from the tree of life. Amen. It was gone and it was taken from them. The fearsome cherubim standing there with the sword drawn, protecting their not coming back in. And I want to I want to disclose uh, this morning, just with the image, I would ask you to use you know in your mind's eye, your imagination, the picture of this last verse, chapter three, of God driving this man and this woman out of the Garden of Eden and placing one of his great angels to keep them from coming back in. And I wonder what they looked like at that moment as they were leaving. Were their heads hung low? Were they holding each other to console each other for the mess that they made of things? Uh, I wonder if either one of them said to the other, there's hope for us if we trust in the Lord. All of that speculation. But I see myself and what's happened to me in my life in the same light as that little picture I just tried to paint. That because of our sin, we have been given up to our own devices before we knew Christ. In effect, we were driven out to taste of this world and its evil. And then we realized when the gospel was preached or shared with us that we could accept Christ and be forgiven for our sins and that we could eat in the tree of life, we could live forever. I mean, I'll tell you something, this is no secret. I, I know where I'm going when I die. Yeah. I'm going to heaven. Amen. You know? And it's not because of anything I've done. It's not even at all that. It's, it's nothing I deserve at all. Clear. I deserve the other place. But because of Christ dying on the cross and shedding his blood, it's the reason, it's the very reason that God killed that first animal and skinned it and sewed together clothes for Adam and Eve. That's what God was trying to teach Adam and Eve was coming one day. And it did. Amen. And it happened 2,000 years ago. And we're here as Christian people today because we've accepted the sacrifice of the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, we can be clothed with his righteousness now. It's never about us. It's never any good thing that we've ever done. It's never any uh, measure of so-called human righteousness that we have. It's none of that. That's all pitiful in God's eyes. We're like Adam and Eve, but we are dependent upon the clothing of God for our righteousness. And that, I think, is the point of Genesis chapter 3 for us. It's salvation. Gosh, I, I would have loved to have been there and seen that. I would have loved to listen to the conversation between Adam and Eve as they were expelled from that garden. But next week, we're going to start on chapter 4, which is about Cain and Abel, a story I'm sure you're all familiar with. And we're going to Drill down into the first homicide in the history of humanity. Father, we thank you this morning for the, the text of Genesis chapter 3 and the record of the fall. Father, we, we can look at it closely and, and tremble when we see our own uh, lives there. We can see our sin. We can see our conversations with Satan. We can see us blaming our wives 
our friends and our children for our sin. We can see us blaming the devil. We can see Father being separated from you because of our sin. Most of all, Lord, I turn that around and give you praise because we can see the clothing of righteousness you've given us when we came to Christ. That because he died and shed his blood, our sin can be paid <coughs> for. It's, an, it's a marvelous thing, Father, and something that Adam and Eve had to experience just like we did. And we give you grace and, and worship and honor for revealing these things to us in the written word. Father, go with us today and allow us to be a blessing. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. 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 Tell her she'll come next week. I'm true child.